Hello everyone, I think you already know me, I'm Angus Wilkinson and as part of the characterization module I'm going to be talking to you about mechanical testing and I'm going to span uh, methods that, that go from very large scale things right down to, to very small scale uh, test pieces that, that actually with a naked eye you can't see. Um, so just to give you a quick outline uh, of what I'm going to do, I'm going to break things up into, into four um, sections. We'll look at some quite conventional things first, um, testing methods in tension, compression, uh, fatigue and, and maybe a couple of other things. Then we'll look at um, this quite important group of testing uh, for material scientists so that actually you learn more than just the mechanics, you learn something about the processes that go on um, by uh, probing the sample with other, with other methods, so in situ imaging or diffraction techniques. Uh, then the third section we'll look at indentation, so both um, quite standard hardness testing, uh, micro and macro hardness testing, and nano indentation. And then finally um, we'll look at some, some methods that uh, the Oxford Micromechanics Group has been using for a, for a while, developing them to, to do some of the things that we've got up here at uh, the bulk scales uh, down into the micro or nano scale. Uh, to probe very local um, mechanical properties of materials. So first up, the basic tensile uh, testing kit. Um, I, I'm guessing that many of you are familiar with this um, already. So essentially we have a system where our sample in here sits within a frame and the frame we can essentially extend. So we can move the uh, this uh, crosshead here, either upwards or downwards with respect to the, the base here. And in this system here, um, a servo mechanical system, we have a, a motor that turns at the bottom and through some gearing uh, turns some threads that run up uh, through here and in turn then the crosshead as, this, uh, as the thread uh, spins uh, will move up and down depending on which way we're driving those those threads. Um, that then allows us to uh, stretch our sample in here and what we'll do then is if we control uh, the extent to which the motor moves we can ex uh, control the, the displacements here of the crosshead. We can also monitor that by having some fixed point on this large uh, rigid mass at the top and have a um, a displacement measuring device in here uh, to measure the, the displacement. So we've, we've got a drive to here, we'll also measure that displacement. And we can also have a load cell in here between the sample and the frame so that we can measure how much load is actually being transferred into the sample here. And of course all of this is, is returned through to uh, a computer system of some sort. Uh, and this then allows us to, to run tests to deform um, our sample in here and uh, measure displacements and loads and from those we will turn them into uh, into stresses and strains which are more useful for us. So here's our system in here and of course really we, we need to learn about the sample and not the load frame itself and the problem is in, in here if you're not careful the displacements up here and the loads in here are all interlinked and it's it can be that, that it's not just the sample that deforms, but the other things around it do as well. So if the sample's quite strong, um, then there can be some deflections in here of the crosshead, and that will get picked up in the overall displacement measurements. And so we need to have uh, ways of making sure that we, we measure displacements here um, on the sample or extensions on the sample. And one way of doing that is to put a, a, a clip gauge in place in here, so this is a gauge that has minimal um, mechanical strength or stiffness compared to the sample. We clamp it on here, that defines a, a gauge section and um, there'll be a, a little device out here uh, where uh, the, the stretch or bending in here will get transferred uh, as a change of resistance and produce a signal um, back that gets measured in the, in the computer here. So here then we're now able to measure the extension on a defined gauge on our on our sample. 
and there are lots and lots of different sorts of these sorts of clip gauges but more and more they're being actually replaced uh, by video extensometry so these are systems whereby uh, we have a, a video camera uh, some optics so that we focus down and look at our uh, our sample section in here uh, we'll mark it it may be very simple it may just be some uh, some pen marks across the sample and we can just measure how far uh, apart those uh, those marks move or it may be rather more elaborate we may have a um, a speckle made with um, uh, a spray uh, paint, um, not complete coverage, but just a speckle pattern on there. And then we can measure how how all the, the particles in that speckle pattern move relative to each other. And from that, pick up, pick up the strain. The advantage here is that actually I don't have to clip anything at all to the sample. So if our sample is, is actually quite flimsy, um, not very strong then this clip gauge arrangement can become difficult if I'm trying to do the test in a, um, a strange environment it might be at high temperature it might be in a fluid it might be all sorts of different things then again these clip gauges are sometimes quite invasive and uh, and can affect the test itself this is rather uh, more remote we don't have to have anything other than line of sight to the sample so you can imagine the sample being in a furnace with a window, as long as you can see through to the sample, you could still measure at temperature what's going on in here. And, and we're using that more and more as our labs uh, all across the world. Information we get out, well, as I say, we'd measure displacements and loads. Well, strictly, actually, we will control with one uh, and measure the other as a response. Most often we'll control with the uh, the displacements and measure the loads um, and the reason for that is sometimes we do see at Luders bands or at yield points we do see some load drops and you won't capture the response properly you won't actually capture a load drop if you're controlling with an ever-increasing load so better most times to have an ever-increasing displacement on the system which is akin to a uh, an ever-increasing strain and you can measure the load and therefore stress response. And I think this is well known, the sorts of things that you'll pull out of this. There'll be a, a linear response to start with, um, uh, elastic. The slope of that will give you our, our Young's modulus. There'll be a limit in here, sometimes quite hard to, uh, to define where we move from um, a, a linear response and where we move from elastic response. In other words, a response where we go just up and down the same line and often we get round that by having a proof uh, stress type of response so we draw in a gradient parallel to this but offset um, to a permanent plastic small permanent pl plastic strain and, and pull out a proof stress instead there's work hardening in here so the slope of this curve tells me well, my work hardening rate eventually I, I reach a, an ultimate tensile strength the highest strength uh, that we have in the system um, uh, the load then dropping down to to failure and of course we might be interested in the uh, in the ductility within the system how much stretch there is before before things fail okay well what do we have to think about if we're designing that uh, that sample um, that test piece well in a tensile test then you have to think about how you're going to grip um, the ends of things it's actually quite simple when you draw it um, what will what will go on but actually when you come to a practical design things can get a little bit more fraught so depends on the sort of sample you've got as to how you might be able to grip it so if it's a a relatively hard uh, metallic thing you might think about if it's a round section you might think about threading the the ends and and uh, threading the sample screwing the sample into um, threads on the uh, on the two grips you may design in some shoulders and have them catch um, on the grips it may be that you you have some split collar arrangement so you have again um, a sample that's got a an edge uh, to the to the top and then you have a a split two-piece grip that comes in and gets bolted together around it or you may have something where there's a where there's a hole through the sample and a pin runs through it but in each of these cases you have to think about how this is going to work with the sort of um, material that you've got 
how can you machine it? Some metal metallics quite easy to machine, ceramics rather more difficult. Uh, again, some some things with polymers you'll you'll be able to do, but others uh, you might not. You might not be able to support enough load through the threads if you're not careful. So all this 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 stuff needs uh, a lot of thinking about. And then beyond that, we we have to think about some other things. So here's an example of a um, uh, a sample that's that's not actually a particularly good sample shape um, for tensile testing. So this is a flat uh, sample. We increase the width here where we're going to grip it to reduce the, the, the stresses locally uh, at the two ends in here. Um, the end tabs would have been nice to have them bigger, rather longer to, to grip. Actually, this was constrained because this was a relatively small sample to go into a uh, so that the sample, the whole sample could go into the SEM. Um, but we, we need to design it so that the stresses are relatively low here and relatively high and uniform through this section here where we want the, the test to, to take place. So we don't really want plastic deformation out here, the two ends. We want it all to, to go on in the middle here in that defined gauge section. And we want it to happen quite uniformly. So this seems to work quite well. It's quite uniform in stress here and it's higher here in the gauge section than it is on the grips. That's good. The thing that where this sample doesn't work too well, this sample design, is just in this, this curvature, the transition here from the uh, from the uh, the tabs at the end here to the uh, to the gauge section happens rather rather too abruptly, and you get these little light, uh, high local stresses here, which uh, cause problems. Okay, so we tend to get with a sample like this, you'd expect to get failure initiating at these points here rather than in the middle where you want it. So this would need to be reworked uh, um, to get a rather more gradual return into this uh, gauge section um, thickness here. Now, of course, this is a very, very common problem. Uh, lots of people worked on this through the through the ages and uh, there are standards. So uh, ASTM have a standard. This is one for, for tension testing of, uh, of metallics at, at room temperature. And here's an ISO standard, uh, a very similar thing here for doing the same. There are other standards for composites, for polymers, for ceramics, etc., etc., um, and in some cases for quite fiddly things like yarns or um, or fibres and things like that. Um, but again, even if you're not going to end up using the standards, it's it's good to be aware of what those standards are, because they do capture good practice um, on a a lot of these sorts of things in here that I've just talked about. Okay, um, let's think about compression then. The other obvious thing to do, instead of stretching on one axis, you can uh, you can squash the sample on, on another axis. Um, and here the sample shapes can be, can be very simple, simple cuboidal or cylindrical sample. Um, of course, you've got no worries about grips. You just need a, a block of material that will sit between two parallel uh, faces on on some platens and be be squashed, so that's that's good. Um, you have to think about the shape of your sample still a little bit. If the sample is too tall uh, compared to its width, then what will tend to happen as you compress it, instead of just deforming uh, nicely, it will tend to to buckle. It might twist a little bit, and you'll get a, an unstable uh, buckling of the system. Um, and that will limit the uh, the deformation rather than the the actual properties of the uh, the sample material itself. It's the sample shape that will dominate. What else do we need to think about? Well, the platen surfaces need to be hard. Um, if the sample is strong, and the platen surfaces are not strong enough, then what happens as you push down on things is actually the sample embeds into the into the platen, and so we get displacements measured there. Or in the worst case, actually, things start deforming uh, in the, the platens and you can't uh, push the deformation into the, into the sample itself. We also need to think about friction. So friction's our enemy here. Remember all the stuff about forging uh, that you, you know about. If there's a lot of friction, then what will happen is that as you uh, press downwards and you reduce the height, the sample has to move out sideways and that movement that sliding on that interface will get resisted by friction and if that's too severe you'll get barreling it will be held back at the top and bottom uh, so you'll you'll lose that uniaxial stress state 
and worse still you'll have a friction heel and that will boost the loads compared to what you'd expect to have. But again this is a very common testing geometry there are standards for it and again here's the standard that happens to be for, for metallics uh, that I look at again at, at room temperature. There are other systems uh, that we could we could work with. Um, we can have hyd hydraulic systems. Um, these are useful for cyclic testing or fatigue testing uh, because the rate at which we can we can actuate things with with fluid in a piston is rather faster than having our motor uh, going backwards and forwards. Um, so we can get up to tens of cycles, several tens of cycles a, a second with these sorts of systems. You can also actually generate quite high uh, loads with this, but the same sort of system is, is in place. We have a fixed grip at the bottom. Um, we have a, a, a cross head that's going to move uh, and be driven by uh, well, through this, this, this piston here. So one end fixed, the other end moving, uh, load cell in here, and there'll also be some displacement measurements. Um, and this is this is good as you can see you can do multiple cycles a, um, a second and build up um, a, a fatigue response as you go through a series of load unload um, on the sample. It's still not incredibly fast and if you think about how long it takes to get to a million cycles um, it's a it's a long time. If you want to go beyond that um, then it starts being quite problematic and so an alternate ways of doing that to, to accelerate things is to move to a, a, a piezo uh, actuation system. And this is something we work with uh, quite a, a lot. Um, you can set up a piezo to be driven at very high frequencies, so at 20 kilohertz in this instance. Um, and so uh, that means a, a high frequency uh, voltage supply into the system uh, that will provide uh, oscillations in here, expansions and contractions that can get transferred to a sample in here um, and you can see uh, through here there's the actuator stack. This is something called a sonotroid so it's just uh, amplifying a little bit the displacements from the actuator down to the sample which sits on the end so this is just zoomed in at the bottom here so that that's the, uh, the sonotroid or the acoustic horn and essentially as that narrows in section um, F equals MA just tells you that that will move a lot more here so it amplifies the displacements and the sample sits on the end here and all of this is designed so that the sonotroid and the sample um, will have a resonant frequency at 20 kilohertz and that means that a lot of power can be transferred from the actuator through the sonotroid to the sample um, and essentially we just use the, uh, the, the free end of the sample here, the mass here with a spring in the middle uh, to generate the uh, the loads in here. So accelerating this mass backwards and forwards at 20 kilohertz is enough to produce uh, megapas uh, tens, hundreds of megapascals of stress in here um, fluctuating at, at 20 kilohertz. And so we generate uh, fatigue quite, quite quickly in this. So 10 to the 6 um, cycles is less than a minute. Um, at this frequency and you can run tests out to uh, gigacycle um, regimes which of course is important if you want materials to be sustainable to have long lifetime uh, in loads then that means you need to be able to test and make sure they're engineered correctly to uh, to large cycles to failure. Okay um, one other thing that I'll just comment on um, there are fracture tests, there are all sorts of different other tests that we, we could think about. Uh, here's just some examples of impact testing. So this is a, um, a pendulum um, with, a, with a weight uh, through here that's dropped, strikes a sample, two different common geometries, either this, this Sharpie, which is effectively a three-point bend, hit in the center um, opposite a, a notch. So the net notch is put under tensile load very suddenly um, and uh, we may get a fracture in here. Uh, the mass then continues, the pendulum swings through, it loses some energy to, to fracturing the sample and so it doesn't swing so high and uh, you can record how far it swings up the other side and evaluate therefore the, the amount of energy that's been lost in the sample. Um, another uh, geometry here is the so-called IZOD um, case which is, is more like a sort of cantilever. It, it's clamped uh, at this 
uh, this half of the sample notched again here and then we just strike the the free end so this is a sort of a cantilever bend um, with the notch but the same sort of principle uh, you see from the change in height before and after the amount of energy that's been absorbed by fracturing the sample. Um, I could just go on and on and on with all sorts of other testing but I'll, I'll stop there we've covered the basic ones of um, tensile testing, uh, compression testing and fatigue testing uh, and we'll pick up um, in the, the next little lecture on uh, in-situ methods.